Hello and welcome to another aircraft tutorial here in MSFS and today we are going to cover the uh, Simworks Studios Pilatus PC-12 which is a turboprop GA aircraft and right away I can tell you that this video isn't sponsored or anything I did buy this aircraft for the full price and uh, I want to show it to you right here. So I hope you will enjoy this tutorial flight once again. As usual we are going to do the full cold and dark startup. We have the PMS50 GTN750 installed, the premium version. And we are going to fly in the Caribbean today from Punta Cana International Airport, which is uh, Mike Delta Papa Charlie. We are going to fly eastwards towards uh, Cyril E. King Airport on St. Thomas, I think it is, in the US Virgin Islands area. So when you buy this aircraft for 25 bucks, what do you get? You get the commuter version that we are going to fly today. You also get the freighter version that has cargo on board and you get the executive version, so the uh, VIP luxury version. So once again, as you can see, we are flying the commuter version. We have six passengers on board today. I'm going to show you the weight and balance a bit later. And still the static elements are attached to the aircraft, the pitot tube covers and the exhaust covers and everything. Also, this sun visor is still installed in the cockpit, this uh, silverish thing that you can see right there on the windows and the doors are opened. Okay, let's have a little look around the airport here. This is once again Punta Cana International a freeware scenery. I will provide the link in the description. Unfortunately, this GA or FBO ramp right here is not very detailed. So I think without further ado, let us hop into the cockpit and start with the initial power up. And here we are in the very well modeled cockpit of the Simworks Studios PC-12. First of all, we are going to get rid of the sun visor by clicking it somewhere. And you can move these sun visors out of the way as well, just like this. Also, you can get, you can show or get rid of the uh, virtual co-pilot right here, the co-pilot model by clicking at this spot. All right, as you can see, we have six modeled passengers on board. They all look a bit frightened, maybe, but still, they are modeled. First of all, we are going to close the large rear cargo or the rear door. So this is the initial closing and then you have to click right there to also uh, secure it and close the handle. And now we're going to close the forward door as well by clicking right here. That will raise it. And you also have to click this uh, handle to secure it. All right, the doors are closed and now we're going to remove the gust lock right here. So the first click puts it in your hand, so to speak, in the virtual hand. And now you have to place it back here behind the or to the left of the pilot seat. By removing this control lock, also the external static elements at or around the aircraft will be removed. So in this payware add-on aircraft, the circuit breakers are modeled and they are working. So we have to make sure that they are all in on the pilots and co-pilot side. These things above the circuit breaker panels, these are little map lights that you can actually also tilt around and they can be toggled on via a switch on the yoke. Further on the left side of the pilot seat, we are making sure that the oxygen switch is in the auto mode. This is the middle position right there. But here we have the parking brake lever. We make sure that it's engaged. Parking brake is on. As you can see, we have a beautiful cockpit instrumentation right here. We have electronic displays for the ADI and the HSI. And this is the altitude and vertical speed selector. This is quite a unique autopilot instrument. And the main autopilot panel, the audio panel. This is the so-called ICE, the engine instrument system that shows you all the engine parameters and also fuel and other things. As I said before, we have the PMS50 GTN750 installed. This is the central advisory display unit that shows you all the uh, warning messages. And below that we have this uh, EFIS50 control panel that controls course, heading, left source and so on. We have the gear handle, of course. To the right we have the uh, pressurization system, so the cabin is fully pressurized, and temperature knobs as well. Down there we have the trim indicators and also the cabin temp display. And on the center of the pedestal we have the uh, manual override lever, the uh, power control lever and also the condition lever. And at the very bottom we have the internal lighting controls. And at this rear pedestal down there we have the firewall fuel shutoff valves and also the manual gear extension pump. 
So this aircraft also has uh, quite an extensive overhead panel. But first of all, let me quickly show you our weight and balance for today. So we have 415 kilos of fuel on board, 780 kilos of payload, that means a pilot and co-pilot, and six passengers. And we also have uh, a bit of cargo in the cabin, as you can see. So with uh, 3.6 tons, we are not that lightly loaded, but also not completely full for the flight. All right, now let's go to the overhead. First I switch the inverter to the battery and then the standby bus comes on. You can also already turn on the inertia separator and the nav light. The master power emergency switch is in the on position, so in the normal one. And all the other switches are off for now, so the avionics, batteries, generators. Also, we don't have external power available right here. Now, by switching the standby bus on, also the uh, standby instruments gets powered, and also the main GPS unit, or GTN unit in this case. Now we have to switch this EPS standby battery to the test position. The green light comes up and we wait for 5 seconds approximately and then we can arm it. So this amber light will then illuminate. Next up we will set up our pressurization system. So we are dialing in the cruise altitude for the flight, which will be 25,000. As you can see this dial goes up to 10 for the upper row and up to 30,000 for the lower row, so 10,000 and 30,000. We take a look at the lower row and we switch it to 25,000 plus 500 feet, so 25,500 for our cruise altitude. And the pressurization rate knob, this little arrow right there that goes to the 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock position. Now we are switching on the oxygen supply. We make sure that all the power handles are idle and in the lower position. Unfortunately, the cabin temperature has a bug for me sometimes, that it shows negative 80 degrees now. That's inaccurate. Alright, now let's flick on the batteries. So battery 1 first, then battery 2. We make sure that we have sufficient uh, voltage. So for engine start we need at least 24 volts. So that's checked. So now let's do the lamp test. So the upper left button right there that turns on all the lamps, on all instruments. So we are quickly checking that all the lights are coming up, as expected. Lamp test off. And now let's check the fuel pumps. So the left fuel pump first. We get the fuel pump noise and also this green light comes up on the caution panel. And the right pump as well. Right fuel pump is now on. Alright, and back to auto mode. Ignition is in auto mode, the uh, ventilation system is off. We are turning on the no smoking and seatbelt signs because we have passengers on board today. Now let's do the uh, fire test. It gives us the fire indications on the cautions panel and also the warning lights come up. When the engine is running and the generator is on, then also an oral fire warning will uh, occur. We will have a listen to that a bit later. So now let us start dealing with the GTN 750 unit. So first of all, let's uh, flick our transponder to standby mode. Once again, we will fly an IFR flight plan today as Trade Wind Aviation Flight 255. The call sign is good speed, I think. And now let us import our flight plan from Simbrief. So this is also working here with the PMS 50 GTN. Under the menu, you can then import the flight plan. And here it is. It also imported the departure, the Mela 2 Tango departure that we are going to fly from runway 09. We won't fly any arrival into a Cyril E. King airport, but we are going to fly the ILS approach that we are going to load later into the, uh, into the GTN unit. Let's have a look at some general information of our departure airport under waypoint info. We can see the elevation. We even have a satellite imagery preview image, image right here. That is quite nice. Right here is the uh, FBO ramp that we are standing on. And we have a very short taxi to runway 09 that is right there for departure. And we are going to depart to the east and also fly to the east uh, all the time today. Here we have the runway information for 27 and 09er. It's very long as you can see, 10,000 feet, even a bit more. 
Under frequencies, we can quickly tune into frequencies or make them uh, as standby frequencies. So let's have a listen to Atis right quick. Tune to team Atis. Information with back 1441. Wind 103 degrees at 10 knots. Visibility 10 kilometers or more. Sky condition few 2000 feet. Temperature 2 minor. Dew point 22. QNH 1017. Transition altitude 17000. Transition level. Flight level 180. Landing runway 08. Departure runway 09. Advise you have information with back. Alright, that was ATIS and we double checked with the WX data page right there. And now we are cleared uh, and now we are tuned into clearance. So now let us set up the altimeter, 1017, HPA it is. Alright, now let's preview our flight plan here on the uh, map screen. The cool thing with this unit is that you can just uh, scroll through the map as you like. It's a touch screen device. And that works very nicely right here. Flight plan is looking good. Our departure is also punched in. The Mela 2 Tango departure once again. So let us have a look at some charts now. Because also the Navigraph charts integration in this unit is very nice. So here we have the charts for our departure airport. Here you can see the airport diagram. And I'm also preparing the ground frequency right now. That we can tune in next. Alright, so now let's continue with our startup checks. Let's have a closer look at our engine instrument system right here. You can see the outside air temp, the generator information, engine oil information, so the uh, temperature and, and the pressure, fuel quantities, and the main engine instruments right here, the torque, the ITT, so the turbine temperature, and also the NGs. As you can see at the moment, the fuel quantity says zero, so we have to push and hold this fuel reset button until it populates with our actually loaded fuel. And there it is. Further we can perform an instrument test right here. That will check all the data fields and everything. So now is a good moment to request our flight clearance to Cyril E. King Airport. Pontacana clearance, good speed 255, parking 3444, request clearance to King with information Quebec. Good speed 255, clear to King via Mel to Tango, departure, runway 09, initial climb 5000, then as filed, squawk 4052. So as you can see, I did the dial in the altitude, in this uh, altitude and vertical speed instrument right there. Via the outer knob you dial in the thousands, and via the inner knob you dial in the one hundreds. Further we punched in our score code, and uh, set it to altitude reporting. And the ground frequency is already prepared. One, two, one decimal, nine, oh, good. And we are nearly ready for engine start. So here you can see once again the aircraft from the outside. Doors are now closed. Static elements are removed. And before starting the engine up we are performing a little pushback. So we get a bit further away from the uh, ground stuff right here. And we can also set up this standby altimeter. I forgot that. And even though the uh, co-pilot instruments are not yet powered up, we can already set it via the needle approximately. Okay, now let's wait for the pushback and then we are going to start the engine. By the way, also below the parking brake lever we have our, our chronograph, so it also features an elapsed timer function. Today I'm going to try to remember to start the timers. <laughs> okay, pushback is completed. So now we are going to start up the engine. Beacon on. We make sure that the inertia separator is open, that prevents any debris and rocks and dust and dirt to get sucked into the turbine. Once again, all the engine levers are in the aft position. And yeah, I think we are now good to, to finally start it. So we hit the starter button. Starter is now on. NG is rising. We need at least 13% NG and also a little bit of oil pressure would be nice. And now we can go into ground idle. And that's all there's to it. Now the turbine and the engine will fire up. Hey, Grant, I'm with 607. We're clear. Uh, we're ready for push now. Right here. The position is clear. All the visuals come. And there we are. We have a successful engine start. The starter disengaged. And we can flick on the generators, so Gen 1 first and Gen 2 second. Then the inverter gets switched to Gen 1, standby bus off, and avionics switches on. Tower 607, start up on 
And also the cooling and ventilation system can be enabled. All right, after engine start, you once again reset your fuel. That's uh, by the checklist. We don't need the ADF radio today, we are turning it off. The ECS switch goes to the auto mode, this is the environmental control system, and we are setting flaps 15 for departure. That is also required for the upcoming pusher test, so we still have to test uh, the uh, yoke, shaker and pusher, the stick pusher. But first let's do the quick autopilot test. Okay, autopilot test is good. Now let me once again show you the fire test that will also now give us the oral warning. Fire, fire, fire. That is fine. Now let's do the pusher test that I was just uh, talking about. We have to move the throttle lever a tiny bit forward and that will then start the test sequence. Now we have to push and hold this button right there. Now the pusher indication comes up once again and that's it. EGPWS system OK. This was the ground proximity warning system test. Alright, now let's have a look at our departure chart. As you can see, we are first flying to the Maroc waypoint and then down to Mela. We have one L2 constraint below 5000 feet. That's all fine. We're going to set up runway heading. down here via this heading knob. As you can see this moves the heading marker and we also have this course knob that we need later for our ILS frequency and ILS course mainly. Let's set that to runway heading as well. The transition altitude for this airport is 17,000 and that's it for now with our preparations with the uh, GPS unit. Now let's choose the map view and continue with our before taxi checklist right here. Let me quickly show you this EFIS 50 control panel a bit more. So with these knobs at the upper right portion, you can control the display, the display brightnesses. Right here you have the decision height knob. You can toggle the bearing pointers for VOR 1 and 2. Or also GPS and ADF, whatever you like. You have the choice between an arc view as well, so you have this rose view and an arc view. But I don't really find the arc view really useful, I must say, because there are no waypoints appearing or no map or nothing. With the nav button you can toggle your nav source, so we make sure that we are in GPS nav source for now. Yeah, and everything is fine. Now let's push the toga button at the left of the throttle handle. That will give us the uh, takeoff flight director. And our navigation is set so far. Right here we can toggle the recognition lights to pulse mode. That is quite useful when departing here in the Caribbean. In real life at least because there may be birds and other animals around. <laughs> and now let's request our taxi clearance. Pulse can ground. Good speed 255. Request taxi. So let's toggle on the taxi lights and that's already it for taxiing. We are cleared left and right, so let's move. In case you are wondering that the yoke is now moving when turning with the rudder pedals, that's because in the Pilatus PC-12 the aileron and rudder is linked together, at least until reaching a certain airspeed. 
So when doing our flight control check now you can see that both are also moving in sync. The rudder and aileron. Alright, flight controls are checked now as well. Trims are also set, you can see in the on the trim indicator everything is in the green band. Also it's recommendable to be in the better range with the throttle lever when, when taxiing. So you don't uh, have to use the brakes all the time, but you can also add a bit of better range or better thrust or reverse thrust to slow the aircraft down. Especially when you're in flight idle mode, because then the aircraft is a lot more powerful. Right now in ground idle mode it's not that bad. Good speed 255, contact Kuntakin Tower, 118.77. 118.77, 7. good speed 255. And there we are, holding short runway 09er. So in case you're wondering what this uh, small GTN unit is good for, I personally like to use it as the terrain radar or the weather radar. Kuntakin Tower, good speed 255, runway 09er, ready for departure. Alright, we have been cleared to enter the runway and now let's turn on our remaining lights so we turn them all on. And also the probes, the probe heaters get enabled now. Now we go to flight idle with our condition lever. And let's enter the runway now. As you can see now the aircraft wants to pull away from us very quickly, so we use the better range to slow it down. And now for taking off it's very important to not overstress the engine. So the engine limits for takeoff for a maximum period of 5 minutes are 44.3 psi of uh, torque and also 800 degrees of uh, ITT. So these are the limits for takeoff, maximum 5 minutes as I said. But as the runway is very long, also lower settings will be sufficient for takeoff here. Now we will start the timer on our chronograph. Everything else is checked. First we are climbing to 5000 feet. Alright, already below 100 knots the aircraft wants to take off, so let's do it. Positive rate and gear up. And flaps up now as well directly. And we are going to engage the yaw damper for the uh, autopilot panel right there. And that's how you take off with the Pilatus PC-12. Now let's engage the remaining autopilot modes, that means NEF to follow our GPS flight plan. Also I'm going to arm the altitude, you have to do that, otherwise the aircraft will not capture the altitude that you set right there. And IAS mode for the indicated airspeed climb, so now the aircraft will use the pitch to hold this airspeed and we are climbing now with approximately 3000 feet per minute. So now is also a good time to turn off some unneeded lighting, so the taxi landing and wing lights come off and also the inertia separator can be turned off now. Now let's engage the autopilot. So as you can see AP is now on, your damper is on, NEF mode for following the GPS flight plan and also indicated airspeed climb and the flight director is of course also engaged. Now we heard the beeping, that means we are going to level off now shortly at our altitude constraint of 5000 feet. Now we can also bring back the throttles as we are flying level for some time. So this aircraft of course doesn't feature an auto throttle, you have to manage it yourself. 
As you can see, we have beautiful weather. We will not need any anti-icing today for the flight. Also, the weather radar will stay empty, I'm sure. Up here on the overhead, you can see the anti-icing portion. So these are all the push buttons that you need for propeller de-ice and boots, the uh, leading edge boots for de-icing and so on. And also the windshield anti-icing. By pushing the heading knob down there, you can quickly sync the heading to your current aircraft heading. In this aircraft, you are not using the landing lights below 10,000 feet, because these lights are mounted on the gear struts, and as soon as the main landing gear is up, you will not see those anymore. So for the PC-12, you are using the recognition lights to uh, stay visible below 10,000 feet, or when approaching a runway or whatever. And right here in the external view, you can see where these recognition lights are mounted. So once again, these are still visible also when the gear is up, unlike the landing lights and the taxi light, of course. And there we are leaving the dorm wrap behind. And now we are finally past the waypoint with the altitude constraint, so we are dialing up the altitude. We have been cleared to 17,000 feet now. So we will arm the altitude and now let's use vertical speed. So we have to pull out the little knob by clicking it, and then we can dial in the vertical speed that we want. So this instrument right there is quite unique, with the altitude and the vertical speed only. And at the left hand side you have these arm and engage buttons, so the arm altitude and the engage vertical speed buttons. But after some, some time you are getting used to that as well. So for now we are trying an 1800 feet per minute climb, bringing up the uh, engine power once again. And now at 170 knots let's go into IAS climb mode, and that will then disengage the vertical speed as you can see. Also for climb you have to stay within limits with the engine parameters, of course. So when climbing you should never exceed 760 degrees of ITT. So that's pretty much the uh, the main limit that you have right there, adjusting the torque accordingly. Right now at lower altitudes it's not that hard to stay below this uh, ITT limit, but it can be it can get tricky when you get higher in altitude. Okay, now we are past 10,000. As you can see, I didn't forget the elapsed timer this time, so that's quite awesome as well. <laughs> now let's turn off the seatbelt signs and the record lights right there. Just like in an airliner. As you can see now on the engine instrument parameters, we are already at 715 degrees ITT and only 35.5 psi. So the engine temp will keep on rising along the climb, that's for sure. Maybe even more when you are at lower air speeds, because the engine then gets less cooling, cooling air. When you are climbing at maximum performance climb, with 120 knots maybe, then the temperatures might be even higher. Alright, finally we got cleared to our cruise altitude, so I'm dialing 25,000 feet in. Once again, with the outer wheel you set the thousands, and with the inner wheel you can set the one hundreds. And once again we have to make sure that it's armed. And here you can once again see by pulling the knob out you can go to the vertical speed readouts, but as you can see I can change it freely now, because it's not engaged, so it doesn't have any impact, impact on our climb. Now let's have a look at the primary flight instruments, the electronic ADI and also the HSI, because we didn't really cover those yet. As you can see in the top left corner we have the autopilot and yaw damper indications, we are in NAV mode, indicated airspeed climb mode and altitude is armed, so the altitude capture is armed. We have the radio altitude in the top right corner and our NAV source in the lower right corner. And on the HSI you can see our NAV source here as well, the GPS source, our heading. Now it just switched to the next waypoint. We also have the wind vector in the top left corner right there, the white, the white readout. That's also present here on the uh, GTN unit, a bit larger. And in the top right you have the uh, distance to the next waypoint and also the true airspeed value. So indicated airspeed is 170 and true airspeed is uh, 234. Also the GTN unit is very advanced uh, regarding VNAV. So you can see this blue top of climb point marker right there. Also right here you can see that our pressurization system seems to work. Okay, I think there's not much uh, left to do now during climb, 
So I will catch you back at the top of climb and then we are going to set up our approach, I guess. And now we are nearly leveling off at our cruise altitude, finally. Let's have a last glance on our engine parameters right there, everything is good. And now doing a very smooth catch at 25,000 feet. There we are. Unfortunately, I forgot to switch to stand-up barrels at 17,000 17, feet, so we have to do it right now. There's always something, as you know. Okay, let me show you some more cool functions of the PMS50 GTN. First of all, the fuel planning function right here. You can very quickly get your fuel calculations by hitting the use sensor data and the present position buttons right there. And it will give you everything. So the fuel required to the destination, the fuel that is still in the tanks at the destination, the time reserve, and humans, time, and everything. Quite awesome. Also, let's deal with the VCALC now, so the VNAV calculator. But we need some chart information first for our arrival. So let me quickly dial in our, or punch in our arrival airport and the approaches the ILS4 runway 10 and there we have it already so course is 100 and frequency is 110.1 so let's dial that in that frequency is in we can also prepare the uh, arrival ATIS in COM2 so the small GTN unit that also holds the COM2 frequency that is now prepared. Further we can set up the ILS course already. And to do that we have to momentarily go into a heading mode for the autopilot. Actually what I have noticed later we could also have used the uh, co-pilot's HSI because right there VOR1 is already selected so we wouldn't have needed to go out of GPS navigation mode at all. But whatever, that's what I chose to do here. <laughs> now let's go back into GPS navigation source and nav mode for the autopilot. So the ILS is prepared. There we can see that at the Kuto waypoint we should be at 2800 feet and then at Jackie 2100 feet. So let's prepare our VNAV calculations for the uh, first altitude, 2800 feet. Vertical speed will be 1500 feet and we want to be at that altitude at Kuto waypoint. So we have our calculations right here. Descent in 6 minutes and 20 seconds. Actually, because we don't have any terrain or weather ahead at the moment, let's use the uh, small GTN unit for the VNAV display. That's also quite convenient. That's it. Also now, up ahead you can see this plus icon right there on the map. That's our top of descent point. Actually, one last thing that we can look at now for the ILS is the uh, decision height. So in this aircraft you cannot enter the decision altitude, but you have to use the decision height, so the radio altimeter value. With this knob you have to click it first, so push it, that will give us the decision height readout on the ADI. And now we have to rotate the knob until we have set 391 feet. And now that's also set. So our ILS approach is now prepared completely. But of course we also have to load it and prepare it in our flight plan. As you can see it's not yet loaded. So we go to the menu. 
Also I forgot to enter our cruise altitude here, that's also possible with the GTN unit. Should have done that before the flight. And now we go to load procedure and the approach because the arrival will be empty for this flight. No star that we are flying. And we choose the ILS-10 approach with uh, vectors, no transition. And we say load approach. As you can see it's all fine. From Kuto to the Jackie and then the ILS. And we load it. And now that's also prepared. I'm not flying GA planes very often and also I don't use the GPS and GTN units too often so I'm sorry when I'm a bit of a noob right here with these units and these aircraft. Still I hope you enjoy the flight so far and then soon we are going to start our descent. As you can see on the chart as well the transition altitude will be 18,000, the transition level as well. And the airport is close to sea level so now we are setting up our pressurization system here to landing elevation plus 500 feet so just like with the cruise altitude plus 500 feet that also applies when landing so now 500 feet is approximately set Okay, we have been cleared to descend to 2100 feet, which is the ILS intercept altitude. So I'm dialing that in and hit the arm button. And as you can see now on our V calculator, the VNAV calculator, we can descend to target. So let's use vertical speed at 1400 feet now. And we are bringing back the throttles a bit to not overspeed the aircraft and now we are descending towards uh, Cyril E. King Airport. Also let us prepare our landing altimeters for the co-pilot side and also the uh, standby instrument right here. Because the only instrument that affects the autopilot is the, uh, is the one, the main one for the captain. So the main altimeter on the captain side. Once again right there you can see our required vertical speed and our actual set vertical speed and also you get this descent marker once again on the GTN display, so the map display. We have quite some tailwind as well helping with our speed. All nice so far. Now we are below flight level 180, so let's set our main altimeter to local barrows as well for the arrival airport. And also I'm going to set this white marker to our decision height. So I'm setting this to around 400 feet. Also for the co-pilot side. Now we got vectors by ATC to fly heading 100 until we intercept the ILS. So let's click the approach in the flight plan and say activate vectors to final. As I noticed that also gets rid of our VNAV calculations for some reason, but whatever. Now we are flying via heading and then intercept the localizer. So now we can change our nav source to localizer 1 or VOR1 for now. Course is set still. At some point, we are getting the uh, distance to it when it gets captured, and we are below 10,000 feet. So let's turn on our recognition lights and also the seatbelt signs. And now, not much more is going on until we then intercept the ILS. Now, as you can see, the ILS got captured, so we have our distance to the localizer. It also changed to localizer 1 NEF source mode, and we get this. Uh, this virtual runway now on the ADI instrument. 
And we are already nearly on the glide slope, so also our descent plan goes quite well right here. Also on the PMS uh, GTN unit you get this uh, this uh, ILS localizer marker right there, the glide slope marker. And also for the frequency below it, the ILS GS runway 10 message, so the uh, identifier does appear. All looking well for our approach. As you can see now we are perfectly aligned on the localizer, so let's go to nav mode. And that will follow the localizer course now. We could have already armed the approach mode by now, but I wanted to descend a bit further before activating that. Now as you can see the wind direction has changed and we have some headwinds, quite a lot of it. So I can already tell you that this will be the most windy landing I had to do with the uh, PC-12 so far. So you can look forward to that, it will be quite interesting. The go-around altitude will be 2800 feet, so that's what we are going to set up in the altitude window right there. Now at 150 knots we are going to deploy the gear and also set flaps 15. And by doing those two things simultaneously this will prevent the aircraft from ballooning up too much when setting flaps 15. Now all the lights get enabled. The inertia separator gets opened once again. Setting the recognition lights to pulse mode now. As we are coming close to the airport. And by the way you can lower flaps uh, 15, so 15 degrees of flaps at a maximum of 164 knots and flaps 30 and 40 at maximum 130 knots. So the beginning of this wide arc around the uh, speed indicator right there, that is flaps 30 and 40 range. Okay, now setting flaps 30 and that's also the setting we are going to land with today. So when the, when the runway is long enough, they usually land with flaps 15 or 30 and only on very short strips they take flaps 40 there because then of course you can be at the slowest airspeed when landing. Also the uh, crosswind comes into play when planning your landing flaps, so the lower the landing flaps are, so flaps 15 for example, you can have a lot more crosswind component than with full flaps for example. Alright, at this stage of flight with flaps 30 set, it's a good idea to stay around 100 knots, so 90 to 100 knots or so. That's a good speed range and that takes around 10 to 11 psi of torque. We are trying to be nice and stable on the ILS now, but we will have quite a lot of right crosswind, so that uh, makes things a bit more tricky right here. Also making sure that the rudder trim is correctly set. When disengaging the autopilot and yaw damper, what we have already done, it also likes to reset the rudder trim somehow. So it dialed in a lot of left rudder trim for some reason and now I did reset that a bit to right rudder trim. That is okay, we have two white, two reds on the puppies, that's looking quite fine. But now 20 knots of right crosswind, that's a lot right here. That will be challenging. Hardly managing to get back and onto localizer track here because of the winds with our light GA aircraft. As you can see also with this aircraft type you get a lot of nose down attitude at flaps 30 and 40 when approaching. Now over the numbers we are going to dial back the uh, throttle to idle slowly and at the same time we are going to do a lot of nose up trimming because otherwise uh, the nose down attitude is just way too much and you have to use a lot of aft yoke all the time. So also trimming up, trying to counter the winds somehow. And we are down on the runway. Now we are going to apply reverse thrust or reverse uh, prop range right here. And at approximately 50 knots airspeed going back to idle and using manual braking when needed.
So that was quite a challenging landing. Once again, I'm no expert with GA aircraft and the sensitive MSFS controls right here. But it was quite okay. I hope you enjoyed it and welcome at Cyril E. King Airport, Tango India Sierra Tango. Now using better range once again to slow the aircraft down. Not uh, riding the brakes too much right here. All right. We made it and immediately we get this trim warning so we have to reset all the trims now. The rudder trim and the uh, pitch trim goes back to the green band. Otherwise you won't get rid of this uh, master caution right there. And now flaps up. Going back to ground idle. Transponder to on mode. Okay, dealing with the lights again. Landing lights, wing lights, strobes and recock lights get disabled. Drop heaters as well. And we can use some air conditioning here because it's quite hot with 29 degrees Celsius. Once again, unfortunately, the uh, temperature indicator is broken for this flight. So the cabin temp, I mean. We are going to dump the cabin pressure. I think that can also be performed shortly before landing, but I had my hands full pretty much. And here we arrived. I'm going to turn left now. I don't fully understand these parking spots right here. But I think... Yeah, I think I'm going to park in this yellow outlined box right there. I think the wing doesn't reach into the service road, so I think that's okay. Whatever, we arrived at our parking spot right here. So now let's do the shutdown procedures as well. The sounds of this aircraft are just so awesome as well, I love it. Best sounding GA aircraft I own so far, I think. Alright, transponder standby, I'm going to delete the fly plan in a second. Now let's disengage the uh, PEX signs, the ventilation system, the taxi light comes off. Now let us delete the flight plan as well. We can also stop the timer now. The flight took around 58 minutes. The oxygen supply gets disabled, the ECS system off. The avionics off, inverter to battery, generators off, gen 2 first and then gen 1. And I think we are now finally ready to shut down the engine. So let's cut it off. And now the final steps on the overhead, the battery is off and also the beacon off. Nav light and inertia separator can stay on, that doesn't matter. That's also what they do in real life. So the aircraft is now powered down and now let's open the passenger door right here. So people can in theory now deboard the aircraft. And now really the final steps are the oxygen selector to off, the uh, EPS standby battery to off and we are going to install our control lock. And that's it. And this will once again conclude a tutorial flight on the channel. Thank you so much for flying with me with the Simwork Studios Pilatus PC-12 today. That was a fun trip in the Caribbean. I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you did, then please consider leaving a like, 
and uh, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. That would be awesome, my friends, and uh, I will see you in the next video, I hope. So, have a good day, stay safe, stay healthy, and until then, bye-bye.